for that. So uh, psychology is about understanding how the mind works, right? And the mind is eventually shaped by nature and nurture. So if you know what nature is or nurture, th throw that down in the chat. Let me, let me hear what you understand. When I say that our minds are shaped by the combination of nature and nurture, what, what do you understand from that? What do you get from it? Do you, have you ever heard that before? What does it mean to you? Throw something in the chat. Let's see where you're at. What do you understand um, from this concept? Come on, throw something out there. What do you know if, you are, if your mind is shaped by nature and nurture? Yes, nurture what we are taught. Very good. Thank you, Laura. I see that. Um, and yes, what born, we are born with it or we are raised that way. Exactly. Thanks, Michelle. So I see those others are coming in. Yes, nature born and um, nurture raised. Thank you. I see that. That's exactly what it is. So don't be afraid to interact. This is an interactive session. Nurture dictates the composite of our biological form. So it's our genes, right? And nurture talks about the effects from the environment. So it's how we were raised. It, it is um, the context, the setting in which you, you grew up, right? And everybody had a different, um, we have different genes and everybody also had different upbringing. It doesn't matter if you were raised in the same family, sometimes based on what part you came in that family um, years later, whatever it is. I hear my own children here, the older ones, telling the younger ones, I don't understand. Looks like mom has changed. Like you don't um, get this anymore. Oh, we couldn't get away with that anymore. So sometimes depending on um, just the situation in, in your nurturing, the upbringing, what was going on, on how you were treated and how you were responded to all of those help to form exactly how our emotions come to be how we think and and so on so it's a combination of what you were given that you had no control over those genes from both parents whether you know it or not whether dad was present or not whether mom was present or not you already were conceived with those genes and predisposed to certain things and therefore Whatever you got now while you were being raised just added to that portion. And therefore, it helps to eventually shape what we feel, how we think, and so on. Uh, so anxiety is what we feel when we are worried about a perceived future threat. So the threat hasn't happened yet. The thing hasn't happened yet. It's a threat. You feel it. You feel like it's going to happen. And so the emotion that comes out of that is anxiety. Anxiety is an emotion, right? So we want you to know that it's real. What you feel is real. All emotions are real, but not all emotions are, are facts. It doesn't mean because you feel something, it makes it true that this is so. So I feel like um, I need to be anxious because tomorrow there's going to be a hurricane. Yeah. It doesn't make that a fact, right? Um, it's, it's, it's an emotion that comes from, base, from what you're thinking at the time and so on. So remember that this has not happened yet. It is recognized as something that could happen in the future. Your future could be a couple hours from now. Your future could be tomorrow. Your future could be next week. Your future could be five years. And we find ourselves worrying about things like that. So when you choose to live in the future, what's really going on is that you have refused to remain in the present. So you're not living right now in this moment, right? And guess what? Some people are, more, are predisposed, more, more likely, more prone to live in the future than others, right? Based on what I just shared about the nature and the nurture. So sometimes we hear people, oh my God, I'm just worried about this interview. It's next week. You have a whole week or you're taking on a new project and it is two weeks away and people begin to worry about something that's going to happen two weeks away, a month away, or they think maybe within five days um, this might happen and I don't know and already you're in a frenzy. 
about something that has not happened. If you find yourself in that kind of situation, often enough, remember that we are looking at two things here. It could be exactly what's going on with you in the moment, but that is coupled with already what you were uh, nurtured with or born with. So it's not just existing by itself in a vacuum. It comes with the fact that if this is what you know, if this is all you knew, if you were raised up in a certain context and this is how people around you behaved, then naturally you learn to worry just like what you got. So this is why, 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 why you? So you would think, okay, why am I always so anxious? Why me? Why, why do I always feel this way about something that hasn't happened yet? Oh, look at you. Some people will say you never worry about anything. How do you live like that? Yet, this other person is always so anxious. Remember, biosocial factors. What you were born with plus what you were raised with. This is the nature-nurture aspects. And these are looked at in different terms in terms of how they impact you, how they impact us mentally, how they impact us emotionally, how they impact us physically. So let's look, for example, at your developmental issues. You may have inherited anxiety traits from your parents. Maybe mom in pregnancy was already anxious about the fact that, oh, she didn't want a child at this age. No, she has lost the job because she was pregnant. Maybe it was during a time where people would lose their jobs once they become pregnant because the companies realize, oh, we're not going to pay maternity leave, plus get somebody else to work in your position, then wait till you're off mat leave, and all of these things. So all of that anxiety could have pushed mom in a situation where she was anxious. Maybe the pregnancy was, during, was in a hostile kind of relationship. So mom was always scared of the partner, afraid of this, afraid of that. Plus emotions are heightened in pregnancy. So there are a number of factors that tend to form what comes together as genes is in those moments. And some of those things are how emotionally pliable we are, how emotionally, how sensitive our emotions are, right? Um, you know, children don't just learn it like that. We, they're already predisposed based on what was going on from pregnancy, the situation between both parents, the situation at the time for mom, because babies sense emotions from in the womb right? So it doesn't mean that, oh, it's your mom that has made you anxious. I'm saying that based on what might have been going on, you could have been predisposed. It is like, think about some families with diabetes. You're predisposed, but do you have to get it? No. If you do the right things, if you eat the right way, if you make certain that you stay healthy. So emotions tend to, you could be predisposed to something, that you don't eventually develop. But then if you're predisposed and your environment creates that situation for you, where your vulnerabilities are so high, your current situations are constant and tumultuous, then what's going to happen is that you tip over that scale because you were already prone, right? It doesn't mean that there's no escape for it. No, it is something that we can work on and it's treatable. It is not a disease. It is not a disorder. It is an emotion to which you were likely predisposed. So I want to throw that out there that emotions are. Emotions just are. They're not good. They're not bad. They come, they go. Emotions behave like those of you who travel and you go to the airport and you notice when you check your bag in and they take it from you and it goes on a conveyor belt. Emotions are like that. Your suitcase passes, especially when you're to pick it up, when you land and you need to go to the baggage claim and get your stuff and you see all the conveyor belt, the line of, of cases and, and not yours. None is up yet. It's just passing. Emotions are like that. And it's important to treat them like that. Don't hold on to it and say, this is who I am. You are not your emotion. I want you to get away from this session today knowing that you're not your emotion and anxiety is an emotion. It comes 
let it pass just like that suitcase that's not yours in baggage claim you're not picking it up just let it pass give yourself permission to let that emotion pass and tomorrow you rise with a new day or an hour later you rise with a new day and we're going to look at how we can do that but remember that you likely hold on to it based on how you were raised how you were cultured you you were raised to see people around you worry and fret and and are concerned and are always worked up that's what you learned and so that's what you know so remember developmentally so so that's genes you might have inherited that because maybe what was going on with your parents they're already heightened in their emotions and they pass that down to you or there could have been some violence some all kinds of craziness sometimes or maybe mom was so stressed out that she started to take a little wine she started to you know smoke a a little weed it could be anything people just stressed out and all kinds of things happen for which you have no control remember that so you're heightened with those emotions possibly because of the genetic piece but you're also heightened because like i said you could have been raised in that situation people are only worry um you know, impact at school every test you're to get you're so scared uh, because you have learned to you have learned fear, you've learned uh, anxiety, you've learned worry, you've, you know, when you grow up in something that nobody has shown you that, then you learn to be this kind of person that, you know what, I'll get through it, I'll cross that bridge when I get there. Those things can be learned. So remember, emotions come, they go. Do not hold on to them, you are not your emotion. Now, understanding anxiety is being able to evaluate what is going on in my life now? So why now? Why am I so anxious? My God, I can't even sleep. Palpitations at night. My heart is just going pitter patter. Like I can't even think I'm getting headaches. I feel like I'm going to lose my mind. I'm, I'm just shaking the tremors. Anxiety, being able to understand that is knowing already how you were raised, what you were exposed to, and to be able to ask yourself, what exactly is going on now in my life to that kind of thinking? Once you begin to think that way, it makes you feel. So it's the thought that will drive the emotion, right? So spiritually, what could be a spiritual vulnerability or how does this affect us spiritually? Is that you become so anxious that you can't even pray or even believe God anymore. You stop going to church, you stop connecting even online, you stop doing things that would, would give you any kind of hope in this um, kind of anxious situation. So we're looking at why me? Maybe you're predisposed. Why is this happening now? Maybe your circumstance causes you to to, uh, because the vulnerabilities are so high. So that particular situation or the situations that are going on will cause you to be more predisposed, to be more prone to feeling anxiety. Now, why does it continue is the real question because we want to look at the fact that, okay, I felt it that way a year ago or two months ago. Why is this continuing? Well, it's probably continuing because you know what? Maybe you're currently still in a toxic situation. Maybe you're still in situations that are not resolved and in your mind, you cannot, you cannot move forward. In your mind, you are stuck in how you are thinking about your situation. And so maybe it is because there's tension and aggression between you and other people. So that if that tension continues, then you likely still feel some sense of, or, or this anxiety around you because you cannot find any peace about it. Maybe it is because you're engaging in situations that conflict with your own morals or with your own beliefs, right? So sometimes the anxiety or the emotion you feel is because it is self-inflicted in a way that you are um, still experiencing something in yourself that contradicts something else that you believe within yourself. So it can be intrinsic to you, internal to you. It's not always because of people around you. 
um, maybe as well, it's you, there's a mental illness or you're prone in some ways to some mental kind of um, challenge, mental health. You're not taking care of yourself emotionally, mentally, and so you're prone. Or maybe you feel a sense of hopelessness. Maybe you feel like I've been sitting in COVID for four months. There's absolutely nothing to do. I feel like I am I'm helpless and hopeless. And so you lack the sense of purpose. You can begin to think negatively and therefore you experience the emotion of anxiety. Sometimes maybe you just feel stuck. You, you tell yourself that you feel stuck and there's no escape and I'm bound in this relationship, I'm bound in this job, I'm bound in this kind of circumstance, I will never be better. And so you're stuck in your mind. Remember, feelings are driven by thoughts. Okay, it's not the other way around. It's not because you feel a certain way that you begin to think. That will eventually happen, but originally that, that feeling comes from something that you first thought, right? So the doctor's office called and immediately as you see the doctor's um, office comes up or the name or you know the number, you begin to, to say to yourself, oh my God, this is what you think, they have bad news. They have bad news. It's terminal cancer now. Oh, um, you know, the, 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 the ultrasound is negative. The, the x-ray, whatever it is. So the thought drives you into this panic. The thought drives you to begin to feel this fear and this anxiety. And so you start to tell yourself, oh, I'm not, I don't want to call them. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Remember, it's perceived, you know, you, have, you don't even find out yet, you know. It's perceived. When you have found out, and you worry at that stage, that's fear. That's fear coming on you. But anxiety is, a fear, is, a, is the worry about something that is not yet. It hasn't happened yet. So I know maybe next week they're going to claim the house because I can't pay the mortgage. Or maybe next week I don't have any food to feed the children because I'm broke. That's next week. It's not yet. Right now you have something to eat. But you begin to worry a week ahead, two weeks ahead, a month ahead, a year ahead. Some people begin to worry because they're planning for school next year and they don't know how they're going to have the money to go to school. And they begin to worry. They get so anxious and it's a year away. That's anxiety. Perceived emotions about something that, is a, that you consider a future threat. It hasn't happened yet, right? So your thoughts will drive a certain emotion. Um, let's bring that home a little bit with what does the Bible say about anxiety? Um, Philippians 4 verses 6 to 7 tells us, be anxious for nothing. You can stay there. Bible can say that. You can say all you want. <laughs> Jesus knew what he was saying in the scriptures because we're going to see that he said that in Matthew as well, right? Um, so, when Paul is writing this and he says, listen, be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about something that hasn't happened yet. But in everything, by prayer and supplication and petition, another translation says, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. The same way, how can we, we turn this in to make it applicable? The same way you can worry about something that has not happened yet. It's the same way you can trust this word and say, if God says I shouldn't worry because it hasn't happened yet, I'm going to trust him that he will do something about it before it actually happens. So you are jumping ahead to worry the same energy you used to do that, you can use it to exercise faith. What do you have to lose? What do you have to lose? It is still out of your control. So you may as well say, you know what? It's out of my control, but at least if I trust God at his word, maybe, maybe it is enough. That's enough to make you begin to say, instead of worrying from now, I just put my energy in trusting that God will come through just before that time. And so Matthew tells us as well, do not worry about anything. What, shall we, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you shall wear. For the pagans run after all these things, but your heavenly father 
knows that you need them, right? Now, in, think of your relationship with the Lord as you think of yourself as being a good trying parent. You, you try to provide for your kids, it is in your, and every good parent, it doesn't matter whether you have much or little. You don't want your children to go to bed without food. You don't, you don't want to know that they lack certain things that they need. I didn't say want, because a lot of things that they want, they're not, it. the needs are met. They have shelter, they have clothing, they have food. You give them love as best as you can. You encourage them, you support them. Those are things that they need. And therefore, if as parents, we can be so careful to know that we will give to our children. Imagine our Heavenly Father. You think he's going to rejoice that we're going to bed hungry or that somebody's going to take back your house or anything that we... Let me tell you, if you lose it, God will replace it and he will give you double for that. I, I want to speak that to somebody today, that it is an uncontrollable for you, but not for God. It is for us, but not for God. He will give you, he tells us that in the story of Job, he will give you, he gave back Job double for everything he lost. And he says it again in Isaiah um, chapter 61, that he will give you double for that trouble that you, he is faithful. And it may not come the very next week when you want it, but I'm telling you, if it's the car you lose, if it's the house you lose, if it's the job you lose, if it's the relationships, whatever it is, Trust God. Do not worry about things you have no control over. Those are uncontrollables. How do you get up every day and cuss the weather? Ah, it's, too, ah, it's, too. It, it's an uncontrollable, right? Don't, don't bother get a headache and spike up your blood pressure over things you cannot control. That's unnecessary, right? So I know maybe you were raised to cause every kind of weather. If it rain, you quarrel. If it's sun, you quarrel. If it's winter, you quarrel. Maybe you're predisposed because that's what you know. That's how you were raised. But I'm saying to you today that it continues, not because that's how you were raised. It continues now. So it happens to you because you were predisposed, but it is continuing now because of how you view it and respond to it. So if you keep thinking, negatively about it, then that's how it's going to happen. You want to reframe your thinking and say, you know what? Here's the sunshine today. I'm going to make the best of it. What can I do to make it a productive day? Oh, well, here's the rain. At least I don't have to water the garden. What can I do to make the most of it? I can stay inside. I can do something productive. I can write that story I've always wanted to write. I can finally journal. I can make those cookies I've been promising the kids to make. Reframe it and make the most of it. You cannot and I'm going to say, you should not, you, and we, we don't like to use these things in psychotherapy. They should, they can't, they must. But I'm going to say to you, you should not worry about things that you cannot control. That is not something you can do anything about, right? So do not worry. The scripture also tells us in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, again, Paul says, control your thoughts. Cast down, tear down, bring down. That's what it means. Every thought and bring it into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And what Christ says, don't worry, your heavenly father already knows what you need. So in light of this, I want to say to you that anxiety comes based on your thinking. Anxiety continues with you based on your thinking. If you can shift your thinking you can improve the moment. If you in that moment, when your heart's racing, when you feel like your mind's racing, you feel in the middle of the night, I'm going to lose my mind. My thoughts are just racing. I can't keep up. If you can shift your thinking in that moment, you would be amazed what happens to you. Can you imagine instead of worrying about something, you reframe it and say, ah, but instead of worrying about this, you know that I can, if I think about it differently, then you get a different feeling. Remember, the anxiety is the feeling. You want to create a different feeling, right? So DBT, which is 
one of the therapies that I use with clients. I like DBT because it's practical. It came from someone who out of their spiritual experience developed this model as well. DBT uses what we call improving the moment. Improving the moment. And they use the word improve as an acronym, right? So think of improve, I-M-P-R-O-V-E. That's what we're wanting to look at. The I represents the imagery. Start to picture your situation as, I don't know, I can't control this, but I'm going to think of a happy place. I'm going to think of a happy place. I'm going to think of all the things. When I lost my job in COVID, for the first time in my life, I have not been having earning from a full-time job. I've had my private practice on the side. I haven't been earning from a full-time job. The first thing was, oh my God, how am I going to support all my children? And remember, I have my quiver full of them for those of you who know. And pay my bills and how am I going to survive this? So right away, my thinking was driving me into anxiety. I woke up one morning and I thought, I'm really feeling anxious about this. And I'm like, come on, Karen, you have all the skills, you've dealt with this, you've been treating clients for this for so long. Get it together, reframe this. And so I started to think, Okay, um, imagery in my mind. Guess what? Well, now that I don't need to work a nine to five, I can, oh, I've been longing to sleep in late. Oh my God, I can sleep in late. No more 8, 30, 9 o'clock meetings. The imagery is in my mind. Then I can get up. You know how many times I wanted to spend more time reading the word? I mean, I did that a lot, to be honest. But I love to do it. So I wanted more time. I wanted more time to hear God's voice. I wanted more time to call people, people that I had no time to call and have a good chat with or chat for a good while. Good while, like a good hour, two hours and laugh and refresh myself. I didn't have that time. Now I started to reframe and I'm like, oh, this actually feels good. Maybe I'm getting even a little bit not so ambitious, but like, it just felt so good. What could I be doing? Reframe this. I can use my knowledge and expertise to share with people on this medium. This is how Zoom was born. This is how this was born. When I was working, I did my two live vlogs, 20, 30 minutes. I'm done. I didn't have time to go prepare all these um, mental health, psychotherapeutic information to give to you. You were born out of the fact that I lost my job. I reframed it. I reframed it. Right? This is what you need to do. Don't, it's an uncontrollable. They made it clear. Oh, you're not losing your job because we don't need you or because it's any incompetent. We value you. We want you. But COVID. What, what am I going to do? It's an uncontrollable. So I reframed it. How can I use my expertise and knowledge and training to help people? You were born out of that. Stop worrying about things that you cannot control. So imagery, go to your happy place. My happy place is when I'm in here, locked away in my room, talking and writing, making preparations, whether it's uh, to preach or whether it's to do mental health um, topics like these, or whether it's just to connect with someone, to have consultation and counsel with someone who I probably helped out of depression or sadness or whatever it is, that is fulfilling for me, that. And I say to the Lord, I have done now. What you have called me to do and my purpose, it's your responsibility to provide for me. So I'm not going to worry about that. Why should I worry over something that is God's role? I can't do that. That's his role. So you must know, you must hold your lane, stay in your lane, stay in your lane and stop taking on the things that you have no control over. Imagery. So meaning, think of that. So, so for me, it's the happy place. I go to my happy place. And that's what I create in these times. Instead of worrying about it, I keep thinking, journaling, all the ideas I keep. That's, that's it. Then M, meaning. Think of what's important in your life. Yeah? Have you been to this place before? Like, have you been here before? Is this the first time you've come upon a situation where you don't know what to do? No, it's not. I bet you it's not the first time. It's not the first time a good friend walk away and left your cause you It's not the first time maybe you lose your job. It's not the first time that you are in a situation that, that makes you worry. It's not the first time you don't know how the mortgage or the rent or, or the light bill or the phone bill going to pay. It's not the first time. 
Even when I was working a full-time job, I still worried about how the bills were going to pay because there were more than I earned. Like, seriously, is it the first time? It's not. So, so own that. I have been here before. Did I make it through? Yes. Yes. And if you've come through before, you can come through again. So this leads us to the P, prayer. Prayer. Meditate ponder be mindful connect with yourself and god let me tell you something um just earlier um in one of the sessions i had you know with a client i thought we've been working together for so long trying to find the point of where what drove your anxiety where why are you so predisposed why is your anxiety so high and finally it popped to the client it was like a revelation we talked about mindfulness how can you stop living in the future and just stay in the present. Feel the cold floor beneath your feet. If you're on carpet, if you're maybe on your bed, feel this, the, the socks in your toes, the, the covers, the comforter, the sheet. Just, just for that moment, right where you are. You are right here. I feel the chair beneath me. I, I, I feel the energy in speaking right here. Not tomorrow, not next week. You're right now. Can you just live in right now and just be still? That's what we lack especially those of us in the church, oh my God, we don't like silence. We don't like silence. So every minute of the day you're chatting to somebody or you're on YouTube playing all the gospel songs, then you search every sermon that's ever preached and you like the noise because you're afraid to listen to your own thoughts and voice. And that's why you are in turmoil because you don't even know who you are. When you pause and stop, just in the quiet, the stillness, ask yourself, why am I really like this? Why do I worry about things? And then it hits you. You know what? When I was six, I remember when my mother didn't have this, or I remember when my father, or I remember when I went to school. Oh my God. And I remember how the teacher made me scared or how, and you realize, oh my goodness, that's where I developed this anxiety from. Pause for a moment. If you are not reflective, mindful, and stay in the present, you will never know the root cause of why you think the way you do. And that leads to the feeling that you now have. It is a reason. And you're constantly just bombarding yourself with all this noise around you that you cannot even stop to get that revelation from God. God's trying to tell you, your spirit is trying to connect, but you are so noisy. You have to retreat. You have to take the stillness in the moment. We call it mindfulness in psychotherapy. The scripture calls it meditate. Meditate. Just meditate. Just stop for a moment. No children. Lock the door. Turn off the phone. Turn off the phone. The phone can be such an instrument of evil. Turn off the phone. And just stay in quiet. Maybe you're not even praying. Maybe you're not even singing. Just be quiet for 10 minutes. Oh my God, there are birds in the tree. I never heard the bird before. Be quiet. No noise, no YouTube, no nothing, no sermon, not even mine. Just be quiet and ask the Lord to speak to you. Just show me. Show me where this fear started, this anxiety. Why, why do I think like this? Just show me and just leave it there. And watch the Holy Spirit reveal himself to you in that moment that you would be amazed. You'd be amazed. 10 minutes, just 10 minutes, 10 minutes. And you begin to think, oh my God, I have life. My bills are paid. Wait, how, how did I pay the student loan last week, last month? My God, that was a miracle and I never ever noticed. You begin to see all the things because your mind is ready to reframe in prayer. Ponder, meditate, be mindful, connect with yourself and with God. And maybe even if you don't think you have any connection with God, Connect with yourself because innately within you is the spirit of God and he's going to speak to you. R, relaxation. Oh Lord. Breathe. 
Just breathe. Breathe. It is okay to breathe. Stop for a moment. Take deep breaths. Just in, out. Just breathe. Feel your belly for the first time. Did you know that when you take in deep air that that whole stomach just inflates and it seems to get bigger and when you let it out it's like a balloon that's just deflated and it just yeah it actually moves i know we don't value our breath because it's it's taken for granted breathe just breathe go for walks even on your own practice calming skills things that make you stop and relax take deep breaths Tell yourself positive things. You know what, Karen, you messed up here. Or you know what, right now you have no job, but it's okay. Give yourself permission to know this is not in your control and it is okay. It is okay. I feel anxious right now and it's okay. I'm human. I will feel. So I'm just going to watch the anxiety pass just like those bags on the conveyor belt. That's not mine in the baggage claim, because tomorrow I will rise again. The righteous will fall seven times, but he will rise again. It's okay. You haven't sinned. You haven't lost your relationship with God. You haven't lost friends just because you feel anxious today. It's okay to feel anxious. It's a feeling. It's not you. It's not you, right? So stop claiming it. Just treat it as if you got a good news and you were excited and then uh, two weeks later we are off so you're okay it's like that it's a feeling it comes it goes based on the currents in your life right and i wrap this quickly they um oh one thing in the moment i talked about that earlier focus on one thing in the moment this is mindfulness all right stop all the 100 things in your head i know especially those of us from the caribbean with the Caribbean ancestry, oh, we were taught to run all four burners. And before, when it was wood, wood, wood fire, three big pots on the stove. And when it was a kerosene oil stove, what? You're taught to run 100 things. And so as a result, imagine this, you start a business. And, and, and then you, you start up another business over here and you start a third one over here. And then you're like, okay, two days, nothing going on over here i shut it down oh three days ah this one's not working either i shut it you have no time or chance to watch it grow you start to do something for yourself you start to journal and all in a sudden because you're doing one million things you stop so all the thoughts all the things you start to talk to 100 people and you believe you're all this that and everything else one thing in the moment focus on it Focus on it, build it, watch it, give yourself time to see if this is working. Then you evaluate, even with a client. We don't come in and we work on a skill and then the next week they come, oh, I tried it, it's not working. Well, seriously, how long did you try? Two hours a day or one, one day and then you decide it's not working? You have to keep trying and trying and trying. That's how you perfect something. Stick to it. Work at it. Focus on it. Be mindful. Don't just give up. If that were the case, Thomas Edison, we wouldn't have had the blessing of light right now, eh? 999 times, a thousand times roughly you fail. Stick to it. Work on it. Focus on what you're doing now. V, take a mental, it's, it's for vacation, but I'm going to say right now we know what the vacation thing is. Take a mental vacation. Just stop. Just take a break. You're trying to write that paper. You're trying to write that book. You're trying to do this strat plan. You're trying to do all these things and, and it's not getting anywhere. It's okay. Take a break. Take a break. Nobody's going to die if you take a break. You've been cooking, treating children, dealing with husband, dealing with wife, dealing with the whole family drama, dealing with everybody's problem. Take a break because fatigue makes you more vulnerable. Right? So when you are tired and you have so many irons in the fire, you feel just thrown your piece of you over here, piece of you, and nobody gets all of you to be effective. Just take a mental break. Shut it down. Stop for a while. Leave it. Give it time. And come back to it sometime. Right? You need to have a vacation, even if it's a mental one. Maybe it's reminiscing on the lovely vacation you had last year or earlier this year, before COVID. Take yourself back to that happy place. 
where you can just say, I look forward to this. It's going to come. But right now, it's great to think about it. Right? And E, encouragement. Boost your feeling about yourself and about others. If all you are is so a Sally, every single day you are so a Sally, everything everybody does upsets you, and everything you do, you judge yourself, you will always feel badly about yourself and others. Give yourself permission to own your failures. You know what? You messed up this time, Karen. You really didn't get it right. Ah, uh, how could you have? Like, oh my God, how could I have done that? It's okay. It's okay to fail. You're not perfect. There is none righteous. I don't care who around you tell you, oh, shame on you to do that. They're liars, liars, lie, lie, lie. They have failed is only because you don't know yet in what they have failed or because they criticize you because you haven't seen their dark secret yet. I'm telling you, they have it just like you. They've been through some rough patches or they have secrets that if that were to burst out, God help them and you. I'm just saying to you, nobody is perfect. And don't let them portray that onto you. Give yourself permission and own it. That you fail, that you mess up. But you know what? I'll move on from here. Challenge yourself to say, you know what? At least I learned that story. Israel failed so much at 40 years on a journey that should have taken them just 11 days. 40 years. And a handful of them made it to the promised land. So who are you to think you're not going to fail? Who are you to think that because you fail or you messed up once, twice, six, seven times, that God can't use you because you failed? Moses murdered and ran away for 40 years, yet God still used him as a deliverer. Listen, your purpose is in you and you will fail. Jesus fell with the cross three times. He could have commanded the cross to go stand on Golgotha's hill and he could have commanded himself on it or off it. There's no one on here. Do not let anyone allow you to feel like you're less than because they judge you based on what they did or achieve or are currently doing. You have your journey. They have their journey, right? Your journey is maybe you're going to fall down three times with the cross. Maybe you're going to lie three times like Peter. Yet that didn't stop Christ from using Peter. Peter became the first bishop of the church. Yet he denied Jesus. You get what I'm saying to you? Stop judging yourself based on the bad patches and the things you faced in life. And you're wondering why you so... Why. Listen, that is your journey. That's your journey. Paul killed people and crucified people. As a matter of fact, it is believed that the very thorn that was in his flesh that wouldn't leave him was the memory he had of how he slaughtered, and that may or may not be true. But the truth is, you still have that to live with based on whatever. Yet, even after he became the first evangelist to the Gentile, Paul wrote um, 13 letters in the New Testament, more than half of the entire New Testament. Yet he's the one who preached out the Gentile church that you and I could have salvation. I'm saying to you, God will not Stop using you because you mess up or because you fail. You a seed that you're meant to be is still in you. And that's going to grow as a tree as long as you stop stifling it. So don't let anybody kill it. And you don't kill it yourself. Encourage yourself. Boost yourself. Ah, oh, girl, you mess up right now. But you know what? Press the reset button and start again tomorrow. Start again. I always take encouragement in this movie, um, 51st Dates. And those of you who probably watch it, it's so long ago, it's old. You can probably watch it. You may find it on Netflix. But that story, the moral in that, 51st Dates, is, is, is the guy meeting the girl. Um, I think it's Adam Sandler. But he met the girl, um, um, Drew, whatever, Barrymore. Yeah. And, and he loved her and so on. But she had, like, amnesia. She wasn't able to remember um, things and and event, but he loved her and the father couldn't see her father couldn't see how a relationship could come out of that and he found a way he decided to make this video every day because she would wake up every day not knowing who he was and she was going to be scared run away whatever but like I said to you what he did was he made this video 
And every morning when she um, wakes up, she would see a note on this little tape recorder, press play. She pressed it and it would be like, you'd be, hi, Karen, I am um, Sam, I am your husband, I'm waiting on the deck for you, or I'm in the kitchen with breakfast. And so she was able to be caught up every day. He did that for every single day of their lives. What am I saying to you? Every day he pressed a reset button to start afresh so that the relationship could um, continue. I want to say to you, you may mess up. You may feel like you failed. Your thinking is racing. Your emotion, the anxiety you feel is coming from your thinking. If you stop to reframe it, just shift your thinking in that moment and begin to improve your moment. With all these letters that I've talked about, it is likely that you will feel so much better. Sometimes your anxiety is so bad and it's high and you need some medical assistance and, and maybe a little psychotropic drug, something to help you calm until you get it together. That's okay too. That's okay too. When, you're headache, when you have a headache, we sometimes pop some Panadol or, you know, whatever tablet until we get it under control and some of us don't need to take any pills we probably just lay in a quiet dark room it's okay and it's okay if you have to take a few pills to get it under control until you can manage it that's fine don't let anyone judge you you have to be on medication you're losing your mind doctor give you oh well how come they're taking panadol for their headache how come they're taking whatever tablet don't let anyone judge you with their stories and behave like they're perfect it's a lie it is a lie. There's not one righteous. Not one. Not one. So I give you encouragement in that today, that God has chosen you. There's a purpose in you. And your anxieties are high right now. And for every reason, you may have the right to feel this anxious. But you know what? You can press the reset button and start again. Start again tomorrow. Brand new note. And say, I give myself permission to start afresh today. I will not think anything negative. I will think of improve. A beautiful place in my mind. I will pray. I will have something meaningful. I will think of just one thing in the moment, focus on that, do my best at it. I'll take a mental vacation. I'll encourage myself, whatever you need to do. Do what you need to do and stay afloat because this is God's will concerning.